Thank you for the Khalsa. Thank you for the... Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Media Watch. Every week we try and get together to talk about the news of the week. Uh, we cover global stories, we cover Sikh stories, and we also look at this week in history. And this week we've got some fantastic guests. Uh, we have the return of Shamsher Singh from the Sikh Research Institute. Why good you Khalsa? Why good you Fadeh? We also have, from last week, our exciting guest has uh, made a comeback because he loved it so much, or maybe because we loved him so much. Uh, we have Navjot Sidhu, QC. Bye, Guruji Khalsa. Bye, Guruji Fateh. Nice to be back, Sabi. Good stuff. Well, you, you know, I had to get you back because um, you know, there's quite a few issues that we need to talk about today where we need your expertise to uh, reflect. And your expertise is always brilliant, Shamsher, in terms of the amount of history that you bring to us uh, and all the work that Seat Research Institute is actually doing. So let's talk about the show again in terms of what the format is. Just to remind you, we start with a couple of headlines and maybe focusing on one in a little bit more detail. We cover off the news in general. We talk about Sikh news around the world, and then we cover it off with This Week in History, the latter two with the support of some Shir Singh and all his research, and then we kind of dive in there and discuss as well. So diving straight in, we want to talk about a serious issue. Uh, it's the first part of the show, the main headlines. We hear that at least half a million people are on the move in Iraq after forces known as the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, known as ISIS, uh, have decided to start invading certain cities, and they're en route to Baghdad. So there's a quick question for you guys. Uh, first of all, starting off with uh, Navjot. Uh, what's going on here? I mean, um, should we really be kind of standing up and saying we need to do something? What are the options for uh, President Obama? And why does it have to be President Obama at the end of the day? Why, why does it have to be Western nations that seem to kind of say, we need to do this, we need to do that? Well, Sabi, it seems uh, with great sadness, this is an entirely foreseeable legacy of the Iraq war. Um, when the Iraq war was called, many people who were in opposition to it warned that the result of it would be that you would create a huge vacuum in countries like Iraq. And into that vacuum would be sucked in extremist elements who would have their own agenda to take over that state. And clearly, in this particular instance, we're dealing with ideologically driven uh, people, people who cross different frontiers, who are not just confined to one nation state, but who have a much greater agenda, which is to spread their form of virulent Islamism across the world, which will uh, remove other people uh, of their rights, including fellow Muslims, who don't want to live under such uh, tyrannical rule. And I'm afraid that the bombings that we've seen, the massacres of innocent people in bazaars and mosques, not just in Iraq, but in Syria, in Pakistan, in Egypt, in Libya, is symptomatic of a malaise that has been growing and growing, particularly since the intervention in Iraq. Now, the question really arises, is it good for Western powers who have a greater amount of military uh, arsenal available to them to deploy that in order to control regimes, to effect regime change, to side with insurgents or with people within a civil war? Or should we take the view that unless there is a genuine humanitarian concern, as there was, for example, in the former Yugoslavia, we shouldn't get involved? This is a really fundamental question about sovereignty and the role of international superpowers. We can't get unanimity in the United Nations. The Security Council of the United Nations, which has both Russia and China and, and America and Britain on it can't come to any sort of an agreement. That's why, for example, Assad has not been moved to one side so far because Russia doesn't want to uh, be involved in that. So there are different agendas operating. Where is the responsibility? How far does it go for a country like America, which has got the ability to get involved? And where should we draw the line and say, this is an internal issue for a nation state. They must sort it out even at the risk of having to withstand a huge amount of bloodshed. I would say that, though, but Shamshar, do you not think that we, um, certain people pick their battles? You know, in certain places, it's fine to go in. In other places, it's like, oh, let them carry on. That's OK. We'll let them carry on, you know, doing their human rights abuses, and uh, we won't worry about it so much. You know, we, we pick and choose our battles. And I think it's also sometimes in the UN a little bit weak uh, in terms of being able to kind of drive through any particular change or use their own forces to say, look, you know, we need to have um, a line, a kind of ceasefire. We need to sit down at a table. We need to talk about peace. We uh, need to iron out, have an arbitration, try and figure out what the problems are. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's no secret that economic factors play a huge part in the decision of... Like uh, oil. 
yeah, like oil and like resources, and play a huge part in the decision of states or whether they decide to get involved in a localized conflict or not. And I don't think that's uh, ever going to change. It's been like that since the beginning of time. So it's, uh, it's, it's an unnecessary part of war, unfortunately. Okay, well, we'll see what happens over the, the coming weeks and sadly uh, days in terms of what's actually happening. I mean, I've just got a news report in here talking about the fact that the Turkish consulate has uh, had 25 staff being kidnapped. So, you know, the situation is very grim out there. Uh, and we were talking earlier on, actually, just to kind of close off this part. Um, yeah, it was a very good point you made when we were discussing this just before the program started, uh, Navjo, about the fact that families suffering again, right? I mean, ultimately, it's the families, isn't it? It was just the, you know, the, the men, the women, the children, you know, where they want to kind of reconstruct their lives again after being through so yep. many wars. Yep. And even the ripple effect that it has to the services, you know, people that go out there and, you know, they leave their families behind to try and defend another nation. Yeah. It's a difficult situation. Well, well you know, we, we need to remind ourselves we are first and foremost human beings. We are not religious entities, right? The people who are the first victims of these wars are innocent families, children, the most vulnerable people who can't defend themselves. And the reality is, I think, Sabi, if you ask ordinary people, not just in this country, but in other countries across the world, what is it that you want? Do you want to have a theocratic state? Do you want to live under Sharia law? Do you want to live under some kind of religious body that will govern your life? Or do you actually want clean drinking water, a regular supply of food, decent accommodation for your family to live in, and good schooling for your children? This yeah. is what human beings actually desire at a fundamental level. And I think that the, when people who have ideological missions that they're trying to propagate around the world, whether it's religiously based or politically based, claim that they represent a body of people, not just in that country but worldwide, we should challenge them and say, you don't represent those people because if you ask the very people that you claim to be speaking on behalf of, what do they want? They won't be saying that they want to have religious leaders who will take them to some wonderful place that, uh, that they're being uh, convinced uh, is the right uh, uh, end stop for them. That's not really what people are after. Yeah, I think the di dynamics uh, vary anyway, depending on where you are, but ultimately, secularism and respect and making sure that people, you know, strength through diversity, those are good things, you know. Yeah. It's not about assimilation, it's about, um, you know, integration and people being comfortable with each other uh, where everyone can live and yeah. whether it be you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Sikh, you know, you all live together in, in peace and harmony and like Dave Allen used to say at the end of his programs, if anyone is old enough to remember Dave Allen, you know, <laughs> uh, good night and may your God go with you. Yes. You know. Um, but you know, Savi, it's, a, it's a, uh, such an interesting thing. That, that tolerance that you and, you and I are talking about that is essential, is a prerequisite to a safe, stable society. In a multicultural society, tolerance depends upon uh, all of us accepting a common set of values, right? And I think the real challenge for us as a modern society now is how do we define what the common set of values are that we are all prepared to sign up to? Because there are certain things that seem to be fundamentals. Equality between men and women, democracy, uh, the ability to have freedom of speech, the ability to criticize, all of these are fundamentals of a modern society. And I think every religion, every great world religion, must make a declaration that there are common values that they are prepared to subscribe there, there are to common in order values, for us all to get on. also respect for all. Let, let's move on to the next part of the program. Well, we will return to this particular topic of um, uh, whether or not uh, religious kind of, um, I guess, agendas uh, should um, rule the roost. Um, we have the next part of the program where we talk about news around the world. Uh, interestingly, we see that uh, Ofsted has published a report on schools in Birmingham with regards to a Trojan horse issue or plot. Uh, this is where there is an allegation of a planned takeover by a certain religious group in certain schools. Uh, and there was, it was an interesting thing that someone said that when the dust settles on the Trojan horse saga, there will be lessons for local government to learn. So... I guess the question to ask is, is it local government? Uh, is it the school governors? Uh, is it the national government to set some rules up? But we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the other bit of work that's going on at the moment is Angelina Jolie is in town working with William Hague, and they are involved in something known as the Sexual Violence Against Conflict Summit. I remember somebody told me about the fact that in the First World War, um, just at Christmas time, the first Christmas that they had, both sides had put down their arms, and they'd got up, and they'd walked across and they, they kind of shook hands and they sat down and they celebrated Christmas together and then they, after that was over, they went back over and into the trenches and started bombing each other. Um, so 
what happens is there are no rules, uh, realistically. I do know that, um, you know, from a Sikh perspective, uh, you know, the originator of, I guess, um, Mary Nightingale, originator of the Red Cross in one sense, uh, by Ganeya, who had gone and uh, given water to join the, uh, many of the battles to the other side that the, the Sikhs were fighting. And because when he was asked, he said, well, I, I see God in everyone, you know. So, you know, that's, that's an interesting uh, perspective. But when it comes down to uh, rape and those kind of abuses, uh, we know even in our Sikh history there is, you know, if we talk about you know, the widow colony over in, um, you know, 1984, um, which I'm sure, you, you know, there's, there's a widow colony out there. Yeah, definitely. But, yeah, um, rape's always, uh, violence against women is um, always used in uh, instances of conflict. It's almost as a further punishment towards the community that's engaged in the conflict. It's a, it's a, definitely it's a serious issue that needs serious attention from world leaders to do something about, to address this issue, because it's a, it's a very unfair thing that women are, suffer so much during conflict. And the repercussions of that as well, if there's a rape situation and, you know, there's a child. Well, we're or, dealing here you know, with a very, very serious crime perpetrated against individual women who are individual victims. But this is a mass crime that is used in wars and has been for centuries and centuries. And it's amazing and shocking that it's only recently when a top Hollywood actress has taken this issue on board in conjunction with William Hague and given it the oxygen of publicity that it really demanded, that people are now sitting up and paying attention to it. Sexual violence against women in wars is a grotesque crime used by men in order to uh, exert their power, not just on the enemy, but amongst those who they have subjugated. And women, of course, in war, and children as well, tend to be the first victims of every war as innocent victims. And I think as six, we need to be clear about what our position is about the equality between men and women, and that we find this abhorrent. And every religion, every self-respecting religion of the world should find this abhorrent. And the fact that some people use religion as an excuse sometimes for perpetrating this offense by so denigrating women mm -hmm. is even more reprehensible. Uh, I think, Sobi, this is, this is crucial because we know, for example, during partition in 1947, that sexual violence against women was also used then to exact revenge upon people when people were migrating across the border between Punjab to Pakistan, from India side to Pakistan and back again. Uh, and, you know, my parents lived through this era and they know it very well. And we've seen programs on television about it. I think it's really crucial because it feeds into a wider debate, particularly amongst the Sikh community, about how seriously do we take the equality agenda between men and women. We pay a lot of lip service to it, but do we really take it seriously? Do we treat the females in our population as equal to males? I don't think we do. Let, let me just um, stop you here for a second, because the other part of the news that I really wanted to cover off was, um, and again, we don't have time to talk about everything, but we can talk about a few things, uh, specifically in terms of global news. This Trojan horse issue associated with Birmingham. Now, one of the accusations there is, to, to pick up your point about equality, um, there was a, a whistleblower uh, that had come forward, a number apparently, about 20 of them, had come forward and actually said, there's a problem here, which I find quite hard to believe that it, two years ago they had outstanding in some of these schools, and then two years later there's this big issue. Is it Islamophobia? That could be one question, if you're really cynical about it. Uh, or you could actually say that, was there something underlying going on there? Were men and uh, girls and boys being split up? Um, was there an alternative agenda? Now, I know you do serve as a governor in the school, and I was a governor in the school for about eight or nine years. Yeah. So I know how difficult it is. I also know that it can be political as well. Let's not kid ourselves. You know, um, there are cliques that can develop within um, governing bodies, uh, and they can gang up against staff, uh, which is very naughty. But in this case, what we're talking about is that did somebody suspect something? Why did it take a couple of years for that to happen? Um, should the government are thinking about doing emergency kind of, you know, we're going to come in tomorrow or we're going to come in the next well, half so hour we, we can as a kind we of can emergency debate, inspections. You know? we, we can um, debate why this was reported so late, but that's not really the issue. The key issue is that there's now a torch being shone on the problem of religion within schools and how religion becomes a tool by which children become brainwashed effectively to think only through one particular uh, set of eyes, and but, I but think. But, this but in your view, sorry, to interrupt you for yes. a second. But in your in your view, you feel um, it, that there shouldn't be a religious well, look, school, Sylvia, or I, you I, do feel I, there I, should I, be a religious school. I have been school? I have been chair, so of, chair of my are, chair of my know, old Jewish school. schools have been around well, this, for years. This is, you know? this is the point. So I have been chair of my old school, my old primary school in Southall, 
uh, Beaconsfield Primary School for the last 17 years. I've seen that school change. When I was there as a boy, I saw it in a different way. Governors have been given a huge amount of power through uh, governments ch changing legislation so as to make them more responsible for the running of their and schools. And it's an unpaid job as well. It's an unpaid job. But like any other uh, power position, whether it's in a school or in a temple or a gurdwara or a mosque or in a government body or local authority, it will attract certain types of people, certain types of people who will colonize those schools and perhaps have their own agenda to prosecute. Okay? So, so, but this is, this is the point here. I just want to say, Sylvia, the point here is people forget what the purpose of a school is. The purpose of a school is to teach our children how to be good, intelligent citizens. It's not to teach them that they look at the world only through one pair of spectacles, perhaps a religious pair of spectacles. That's not the idea of what schools were. And we have seen in Northern Ireland where we had Catholic schools and Protestant schools. There was segregation between the two, just like there was in South Africa, between white people and black people, that the end result of bringing up your children like that is for them to view with suspicion other communities, and you will never have but, you know, if you healthy look at, integration if, if you, you do look that. at the success record of some of the schools, right, especially um, there's, there's a school that's not too far away from where we are right now, that has been outstanding success, outstanding in terms of Ofsted, outstanding results, have a great multicultural policy, have a great respectful policy for other religions as well. They may not even have a head who is from that particular religion. Uh, the fact that they have the same right as everyone else to be able to apply for funding, set up a school, and um, put forward some great values into kids. I mean, generic values, right? So we have this under, you know, underlying question of values. Um, I was going to bring some sharing. I mean, obviously, you're from a, an educational institution in one sense, aren't you? Education is important. One of the great things that SICRI did was that they set up consistency among the syllabus over in Canada and also in the US associated with uh, teaching the Sikh syllabus. So yeah. th those are great things that come yeah. about through institutions. We, if we look at the positive side of it, um, and, but if we return to the issue about being in a school, should you, you respect other people. You don't go, go one-sided, do you? I think, I think faith school is a bit of a misnomer because you don't actually learn more about your particular faith just because you're in a faith school. You're still taught according to the national curriculum standards. Absolutely, yeah, the national curriculum. And I think it doesn't make sense for a community, especially that's a community that's a minority, to further exclude themselves from society and create this separate social space. That's your opinion, right? Yeah, that's my opinion. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a difficult decision for a community, obviously, because you want to protect the core of your community and you want to um, share the values that you have as a community. But I think um, a faith school isn't perhaps the most appropriate place to do it because we need to integrate into society and integration doesn't necessarily have to come at the cost of our values. Again, I just have to kind of put it on the record. This is personal opinions, right? Uh, these aren't opinions of the channel or anyone else. But um, just to make it clear, as I said before, you know, some of them are runaway successes. Fantastic kids there who really enjoy being there. They get great results. Uh, I'm, I'm just kind of making sure that we have a balanced is there is there a study done and if you were afterwards. to talk to some of those kids or talk to some of the parents yeah. they'd love it they'd how love will the these kids do in um, colleges or universities and some and of them go on to great places some of them do uh, but, some but, of them but, don't but I have to say I agree with Shamshir about his own um, his, his own doubts about whether faith schools are the way forward I, I also take I, the I think view. in this case though, yeah, but we, we're but, not, we are talking about this case we're not talking about schools in general if we, let's not make the mistake of equating correlation with causation yeah. okay you cannot assume that just because certain faith schools are performing particularly well, that it's because they are faith schools. Some faith schools operate selection in the intake that they have. And it means that they attract a certain type of pupil. Now, those pupils may be motivated because they're religious, or they may be motivated because their parents actually put a high premium on education. Right. There are many communities in this country, and we've seen them with immigrant communities in particular, who went to secular schools like I did, and the children did fabulously well. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do with their faith at all. Their faith was something that they protected and nurtured in a family environment and in their religious environment like a gurdwara or a temple and other places. My own view is that if you want to develop children with a sense of their citizenship and their identity as citizens of this country, you must have them integrating on a daily basis with kids from other faiths. And faith schools, let's remember, Sabi, they are faith schools. They tend to have a small proportion of their places reserved for members of a different faith but the reality is that the vast majority of children at school will be from one faith. And this is where you breed problems. This is my own view. What I would say is that in the context of the story that actually came, uh, the story came about because uh, there was a suspicion of particular extremist values. We're not saying that 
uh, extremist values are being exhibited by all faith schools. We're just saying in this particular case, there was a suspicion, and therefore there are certain measures that are taking place and have been put into place. Now, every school is subject to Ofsted. Every school is subject to certain standards, and some schools do better than others, right? So we'll leave it at that for the moment, okay? Um, let's move on to the next part of the program where we talk about uh, Sikh news around the world. Shimsher, tell us what's going on. I heard about some thing known as Kickstarter. What is Kickstarter? Is that something that you... you yeah, it's a uh, crowdsourcing. Kick them and then everyone sort of starts on them. Uh, I don't think so. It doesn't sound like a very good idea. It's to me. A, a crowdsourcing website where you basically... Crowdsourcing. Can, yeah, so, so what does that mean? You put a project up on the internet and you, if people like your project, they can contribute it. So you basically, from the crowd, you source all your funds and okay. the cool. project... So you can there. become like a virtual shareholder? Yeah, pretty much. You get certain rewards for contributing towards the project. Um, the project the mo at the moment is, um, that's gained the media attention is called the Singh Project. And it's an art exhibition photography um, of uh, Sikh men wearing a dastar in a turban. And it's started by two photographers from the UK. Um, and their goal was to raise 7,000, which they've actually met, I think. Uh, I think that's related to the amount of uh, publicity they've had recently. Yeah, a lot, quite a lot of it. Online. Yeah. Quite yeah. a lot and on social channels. Right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and the goal of the project is to create an exhibition where they can display the photography that they've taken as a celebration of uh, Sikh identity and because, culture. Because uh, beards are in, right? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. I think it's a, it's a growing fashion trend. You need to jump on I've got to catch up on this. Yeah. It sounds like George Clooney's already there. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And I suppose a poster I saw <laughs> driving into London, and I couldn't help it. I thought maybe there was a guy who had a, a beard in the Jura. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I thought, it's apparently it's is that actually the next, the it's next a fashion, fashion thing right, right now. Have a Jura, right? Yeah, it's a, it's, I think it's a Russell brand. He <laughs> made it famous, and David Beckham. It's okay. like a, a little Jura and a, a, a beard. Okay, right. But you know, the point, the point that comes out of this, what, what uh, Shamshir is saying is very interesting, I think. But you, we talked about this last week, didn't we, Savi, about social media mm. and how it's important for people who are ordinary folks to feel empowered that they can contribute to big debates, whether mm. they're national or international. But we know also, because we were encouraging this, how, it, how important it is for the Sikh community, for example, not to feel that it's being excluded from the media by saying to itself, well, we will create our own noise. And we know that they can do it, but what we don't want to see is a situation where people who are very active on Twitter and social media end up dictating what the debate is all about, right? And then all the people who don't have that versatility, who aren't so techy, find that they are left out in the cold. Remember, at the end of the day, we live in a democracy where we elect our representatives, whether they're councillors or MPs, to go into parliament and represent our views. And we can't directly impact on legislation. We have to do it through those people. So I think the real issue is, what are we doing in order to bombard our representatives, whether they're MPs or in the Lords or their councillors, with our views so that they go and reflect them in the, in the in arena where these things are probably and, and to be And I think Canada is a good example of that. I think that yeah, definitely. A, it, what's his name? Uh, uh, Jagmeet Singh right. uh, from the National Democratic Party, who has won his second term. Uh, in office in Canada, Brilliant. and that is all built around social activism. And he's a very nice guy. I yeah. Mean, yeah, really, really good yeah. things about him actually. Yeah. yeah, and if you look at his campaign initially, the first campaign that he won, it was all based amongst his peer group, and a lot of it was uh, around social media and spreading word of mouth and getting um, youngsters involved in politics. And I think it's uh, definitely an important. Yes, and, what a, and what a good example as well, Sabi, yeah. of younger people who don't generally speak and get a chance to be representatives in politics, because we know there's a serious problem in the Asian community where. The MPs and the councillors that we have tend to be from an older generation. They do, they do. And younger people, despite trying hard to break the glass ceiling and get a chance to represent their communities, they don't get brought in. And they get excluded because this is about power, and power is very rarely ever shared willingly. Well, I think what it is is that somebody once described it to me, and I have to give congratulations to a friend of mine who's become a councillor recently, uh, Mukesh Malotra. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, uh, I was talking to him ages and ages ago, and, it's very difficult to sometimes break into being a counselor because a lot of, mate, I call them matey boys, yeah. you know, friends of friends of friends yeah. who sometimes kind of let them be in It's a political machine, isn't it? That's Absolutely, why yeah. And sometimes media. it's not about how brilliant you are as a person or yeah. what you bring about. It's who you, is, it, who it, you know. It, is it another topic, another day? Yeah, absolutely. We need to discuss about whether there's real meritocracy in the way in which we elect our politicians. Is there real meritocracy? Are we happy with the representatives I think we could do an entire program. Or, or, should, or should we be encouraging Maybe we should bring those involved? new people on board who've recently won in Maybe the council. Maybe we should. And, Let's and hear about their successes. You know, what was your work? difficulty in terms of getting this far? Or I know that the uh, UK government a um, few years ago uh, strongly encouraged one black vote or one Operation vote, Black Vote, yes. Vote, and that was to bring in board, more magistrates, more yes. uh, MPs. So that was an interesting initiative. Now, um, last part of the program, we've only got literally a couple of minutes left to go through this, uh, sadly. Time has 
rush by it always like does. normal. Um, I wanted to pass on to Shamsher Singh uh, a moment in history. I think uh, pick one. You've got a number here. Uh, you've got the uh, Shidi of uh, uh, Bada Singh Bahadur. Yeah. Uh, tell me. Um, so this week is uh, in Sikh history is a uh, it's a week of echoes really. As we see um, the closure um, in 1984 of the attack on Darbar Sahib. This week we're seeing protests all around the world that are taking place. 60,000 um, people, just wanted to point out, yeah. that came into London. And I, I saw a fantastic photograph of New York, Canada, yeah. London, uh, I think it was another uh, place in the U.S. where you had thousands of people all standing together. Yeah, in San unity. Francisco, 15,000 right. um, turned out in California. Yeah, so um, that, these events that happened in 1984 were echoed previously in 1746. Uh, we saw the Shota Kallukara where 10,000 Sikhs were killed in and around Lahore. So these kind of events are echoing this, uh, at this time in our history. And we saw, as you said, the Shahidi of uh, Banda Singh Bahadur. Um, and we also had the uh, Prakash Ustav of uh, Guru Hargobind Sahib. So it's, uh, it's a kind of a, a, a time, uh, um, uh, a month of political activism and um, confrontations. So it's a very... And a commemoration of yeah. those innocents. Yeah. Um, now let's uh, end the show, sadly. You know, we've uh, almost run out of time. Uh, just a quick summary. We were talking about uh, some of the events in history just now. Uh, yes, we have been talking about success stories, uh, and we congratulate Jagmeet. Um, we were talking about the Singh Project. Uh, in the world news, we covered off uh, areas like the, um, uh, the particular summit that's going on to end sexual violence in conflict. Uh, we spoke quite a lot about personal opinions about faith schools, uh, and specifically, there was a negative example, potentially a negative example, uh, of uh, a Trojan Hall situation over in uh, Birmingham uh, with the suspicion of possible extremism. Now, in our main headline, we spoke about the fact that the sadness that's going on in continued uh, conflict situations over in Iraq. Uh, and, you know, we, we can only hope uh, that, you know, that suffering does not continue, that there are solutions, that the world community can come together and think of peaceful ways of moving forward or actually trying to get people around a table to say, you know, this kind of destruction, this kind of evil, this kind of terrorism is uh, unacceptable to hurt your own people. Uh, effectively. So that's it for this week. Uh, thanks very much to my guest, uh, Shamsher Singh from Sikri. Thanks so much, Navjot uh, Sidhu, QC. Appreciate it very much. Until next time, Waigurji Kakalsa, Waigurji Kifateh.